you want to make sure that when you're creating something, it's not a one and done. You're not a one hit wonder and your content shouldn't be either. You want to figure out how to extend that life of it and how to make sure that it can work for you long after you create it. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Gold Diggers, I have a podcast recommendation for you. If you like staying in the know when it comes to trends in business, well, you'll love My First Million podcast hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Pori, brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network. My First Million brainstorms new business ideas based on trends and opportunities in the market and shares the stories of how companies made their first million. It's conversational and interesting with insights on topics that we don't always get into on Gold Digger. NFTs with Gary Vaynerchuk, direct-to-consumer strategies, how vending machines are generating millions. Sean and Sam have their ear to the ground for the next big thing in business, and the guests are top notch. Listen to My First Million wherever you go to get your podcasts. Thanks to Gusto for supporting the Gold Digger podcast. Gusto offers modern, easy payroll and benefits to small businesses across the country. They even were named the best online payroll by PC Meg. Get three months free when you run your first payroll at gusto.com slash gold digger. So the other day I was looking through some copy that we were writing as a team and we had used the term content creator and I highlighted that term and left a note in the document and said, sometimes I hesitate using this terminology because so many people don't consider themselves a content creator and I don't want people to write themselves off before they learn that they are in fact someone who creates content and can find value in claiming that title and really creating a system around it. And so in lieu of that subject, Kylie, welcome to the show. We get to talk all about content creation today. And this is something that you and I really align on with our visions, our systems and our strategies. Well, when content creation is so much a part of your job, (laughs) you can't help but figure out a way to do it well Mm -hmm. and with strategy and be efficient with it. Because with the amount of stuff this brand puts out on a weekly basis, like we've had to become experts in it. It's so funny. Why do you think that people like don't lean into that title? I think that so many people you know, start their business and they're working on mastering their craft or their product or their offer that they don't recognize all of the pieces that they're writing, all of the supplemental information, all of the ways they're showing up online, make them a content creator. Do you have any notions around that? Because I think that term can be a sticking point for people. Well, I think we're underselling the power of what that title is means. It's almost like there's a silent just before it. Like I'm just a content creator, which hello, if we were to do a word count of everything we create during a week, (laughs) God, I mean, we'd have a full encyclopedia per week, you know, of, of what we create. So I think people just undersell the power of what content can do for a brand and for a business and the community it can create. So I think it's just that we don't see it as a superpower. We just see it as a thing we have to do or we it's like they don't want to be labeled it because it's just a content creator and like it needs to be celebrated more. And honestly, 98% of the content creators out there they're creating content around their offer. They're not solely content creators and getting paid for their content per se. Their content is created with an end result in mind, which is something we're going to talk about today. Heck yes. So speaking of all the stuff we create in this brand, I know it wasn't like this when you first started, (laughs) but let's talk about what we do release now because it's a lot. Yeah. So 
It's kind of crazy when I look at it. And I think, too, it's even more front of mind as I go into maternity leave because we've been living this content schedule out in advance to prepare for what would be a maternity leave. So every single week, we release two podcast episodes. One's an interview. One is a solo show. We also release two blog posts in conjunction with the solo show notes. So there are four blogs being published every single week, two that are just standalone blog posts, two that are show notes for those episodes. We also send out two emails to our full email list, two text messages to our text message subscribers, and then of course, numerous social media posts on platforms like Pinterest, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. So when you look at all of that content, That's happening on a weekly basis, which means we are massive content creators over here. Yeah, I think it's important to note that that's not how your brand started. And you don't have to create that amount of content every week to see success in your business or to like see a result from the content. I think your wingspan has only expanded by bringing on other creators to help you create all of these things. That's just... I mean, that's the list. And what's interesting too about everything we create is like, we're not just creating to create. Like we don't have time for that. that Every one of those pieces has a very specific goal and motive behind it. So with that, were you always a content creator? Like, have you always been creating this much? So it's actually kind of wild when I think back to my early days. So not a lot of people know this. When I launched my business, I basically did it on a free WordPress blog. And I blogged Monday through Friday, every single Monday through Friday for years straight. Did you know that? Well, I've heard it before, but it's still kind of unbelievable to me. is. And it's like, what did I have to say? I mean, why was I ever afraid of starting a podcast and running out of things to say when I was publishing blog posts Monday through Friday for years? The other crazy part of that story that, again, not a lot of people know is in conjunction with my photography business, I had also launched a Midwest wedding blog that also published Monday through Friday. So I was publishing two blog posts per day, one on my own blog and one on a Northwoods wedding, which was was my Midwest wedding blog at the time. And I was doing that while working full time. So it was super interesting. And I would not do it again. (laughs) But (laughs) it gave me this goal of consistency. And while I've learned so many lessons of things that I would do differently, it was actually just a really cool way for me to be publishing and to be sharing and to be kind of forming my ideas and what that would look like. And I was definitely not strategic. It was a lot of personal things. I didn't really understand the objectives of content creation, but it did give me structure and help me learn how to create in advance and plan out posts and things like that. So it is kind of wild because I would post five days a week and I did it literally for years straight. Do you think that content creation is a non-negotiable for an entrepreneur, for someone starting a business? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. These days, I think that a lot of times people start businesses with this mindset of like, if you build it, they will come. (laughs) And I just, it's not the reality. Like nowadays, people are really focusing on giving clients an experience. And a lot of times that experience is digitally. And a lot of times that experience is really footed in raising awareness and educating and entertainment and all of these different pieces that help create this memorable experience that people really enjoy and that helps build the know, like, and trust factor. And there are so many other reasons why content creation matters from search engine optimization to driving traffic to your platforms to getting people off of social media and into space you own. But you should be creating content because it really helps to set you up as an expert. And it allows people who might not be on the market for what it is that you're selling right now to glean something from you to get some sort of value exchange so that if and when they become ready and qualified as a customer, you are the person that they're purchasing from. I had a total light bulb moment a couple of weeks ago. So I have a merch shop that supports my podcast. It helps me pay the hosting expenses. You know, I'm not getting rich off it or anything, but it is important for me to sell a couple items every month. And I hadn't been 
promoting it at all. I hadn't been talking about it. I just had the tiny little shop word up in the left-hand corner of the navigation bar on my website. And I was like, shoot, why are more people not buying my sweatshirts? So I made one blog post about it. And I posted that one blog post on my podcast Facebook page. And I got five sales. And I was like, no kidding. Yes. (laughs) You mean I have to tell people about what I have for them to know that they can buy it? Wow. You know, it's funny because I, you know, when I started my business a decade ago, the internet landscape was a lot different than it is today. And thankfully, I went to school for PR. I always envisioned myself being like Lauren Conrad in the hills when she <laughs> worked at Teen did. Vogue, right? Like that <laughs> yeah, was yeah. that was the vision. And what's so funny is, thankfully, with my background in PR, I kind of recognized early on that it is my job to be the publicist. Like I need to be the person that is pitching and sharing and communicating and getting that information out. And I've always been really proud that I've never been afraid to like pitch myself or to continue to remind people with these gentle nudges, either through blog posts or Facebook posts or celebratory posts or whatever that looked like in those early days. But I think a lot of times now people discount the fact that like you are your own publicist. If you don't have the budget and you're not hiring someone, it is up to you to be the person shouting from the mountaintops what you're doing, what you're creating and what's for sale. So I love that you had that moment. I felt so dumb. I'm like, oh, of course. Oh, I have to tell people I have things for sale for them to buy them? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So I'm now taking my own advice. So I want to know, what did you kind of figure out that you were doing wrong, that you kind of see some people having the same missteps early on, that we can help them course correct when it comes to content creation? That was a lot of C's in a row. (laughs) I think that there's a lot of things. So I have four main things that I think people are getting wrong. And when I say people, myself is under that umbrella as well. And even to this day, with how streamlined and strategic we create content, we can still fall into these traps. So if you're a seasoned pro at content creation, or you're just getting started, listen to these four things, because this can absolutely transform the way you look at content and the results it gets. So first is not thinking about the customer journey or the experience. So when you're creating content, you want to have that customer in mind and your content should be focused on them, not pointing you as a superhero, but really focusing on them, their experience, where they're at, anticipating the questions they might have or the search bar, search engine things that they're typing in. And you want to really focus in and hone in to create for your customer wherever they are on that path and what it looks like to kind of guide them along that journey. And I think a lot of times content creators, the ego can get in the way you're creating for the sake of tooting your own horn or sharing your own wins. But when you create content, you want it to be very customer centric. And you want to think about an experience or a journey because people are going to remember the way that you made them feel or the value that you gave them without asking for anything in return. The second thing that I think people are getting wrong is that they're spending so much time creating and not promoting. And this is actually a trap that we can fall into really easily as well because of our robust content creation schedule. But the thing is, is that people spend like 90% of their time creating and they spend about 10% of their time promoting. And we've tried to flip that on its head in the sense of really thinking about how do we give our content longevity? How do we promote it with different angles? How do we make sure that if somebody missed it today, they can see it tomorrow? I think a lot of times we create a piece of content, we pop it up on Facebook or Instagram, and we forget the fact that like three to 5% of our audience even sees that post, let alone engages with it. And so if your only way of sharing your content is on social media, then you've got to figure out ways to expand that so that you're focusing not just on the creation process, because creating is great in and of itself. But if no one sees that creation, then you kind of are missing the point. So you want to also focus on how you're going to promote it and how you're going to promote it over time. The third thing that people get wrong is that they spend so much time creating on platforms that have really short shelf lives. So we just experienced the raspberry season this summer and my grandpa took over my grandma's garden when she passed away, which is just such a beautiful thing. He had no experience in gardening. And now it is a thing where he'll like leave family functions early because he's like, I got to go home and pick raspberries before they fall. And so it's really sweet. But 
thinking of that, it really got me thinking about shelf life in the sense of these raspberries, you know, they're only good for a few days. And, you know, we spend so much time nurturing and creating and, and they're such a gift when they're here and they're ripe. But when we look at online content, so many creators are creating on these platforms where Instagram recently said like you have basically like three to five hours to catch someone's attention before the algorithm will kind of distribute your post or decide to kind of shelf it. And so if you're creating and your posts are living and dying within three to five hours or max 24 hours, you're kind of putting yourself on this hamster wheel where you have to continue creating in order to get a result. And so you want to look at ways to get the content that you work so hard on a longer shelf life. Different ways to do that usually come in the form of longer form content where you can use things like keywords, search engine optimization. Pinterest is a place. On Pinterest, the average pin can drive results for 30, 60, or 90 days, whereas an Instagram post is 24 hours. So when you think about that, you want to kind of be investing and hedging your bets in terms of where your content is showing up and how you're creating it to make sure that it's not like the raspberries where once they fall, they're dead and gone, and now you're on to the next batch but that you can actually drive results for your content in the days, weeks, and months, and even sometimes years to come. And then the fourth piece is not creating content with an end result in mind. So Kylie, you kind of hinted at this earlier, but you said every single thing we create is with a purpose. Like we have a goal in mind. And one of the things that we do so well on our team is that we reverse engineer every single thing. So we look at what is the end result for this episode, this blog post, this Facebook post? What is the goal? Where do we want people to go? What is the next step that we want them to take? We try to create these experiences for our listeners, our subscribers, our readers, our viewers, so that if they are ready and willing to go on that next step with us, they know what that step is. We kind of have this saying, no dead ends, where we just want to continue extending invitations for people. So those are the four main things. Not thinking about your customer experience, spending too much time creating and not promoting, spending too much time creating on platforms with short shelf lives, and not creating content with an end result in mind. And they are very easy traps to fall into. But when you're aware of them, it can absolutely shift the way that you create. If you've reached a point in your business where a customer relationship management platform is necessary to keep growing to the next level, well, you'll want to work with a CRM that's simple and seamless to implement and use. HubSpot's powerful CRM platform is easy to adopt, which leads to better data, richer insights, and a bigger impact on customer experience. Tools like HubSpot's contact timeline give you the historical context you need to get work done and connect with customers. And because all of your customer data is in one place, it can serve as a single source of information about each customer's history with your brand. Past conversations, messages, all of it, and you can take action right from the contact timeline. Make a call, enroll a contact in a sequence, schedule a meeting, and more. And if you're on the go, you can use the HubSpot mobile app. Super key for our constantly evolving online businesses. Learn more about how you can scale your company without scaling complexity at HubSpot.com. The secret to running a business that doesn't run you? It's all in the systems. I am such a stickler for efficient, effective systems, especially when it comes to entrepreneurial tasks that aren't necessarily my superpower. When it comes to your system for filing taxes, running payroll, figuring out benefits, HR, and more, try Gusto. Gusto offers easy online payroll benefits and HR built for modern small businesses with all the management tools you need in one platform. Gusto automatically files and pays all state, local, and federal payroll taxes. Plus, the fast, easy-to-run payroll includes W-2s and 1099s for your team, as well as the tools to manage health benefits, 401ks, and more for almost any budget. All of your employee paperwork is stored online, and on average, payroll takes just 11 minutes to run. If you want to love running payroll as much as your employees love payday, try Gusto. Get three months free when you run your first payroll at gusto.com slash gold digger. Try it out at gusto.com slash gold digger. So with that, knowing that those are some common missteps, how do we avoid the missteps? How do we course correct? Like what are those 
three key pillars you would say to creating content? Yeah. So one thing I got right, which I've got to give credit where credit is due, is in my early days, just being consistent and understanding the power of consistency. While my early blog posts were absolutely not tied to any results, or there wasn't any sort of journey for people to go on. I was consistent and I learned the power of consistency and consistency shows up for us on this show. It shows up for the way that we show up for our audience. We make sure that we are providing that experience through consistency because it's so important that your audience can know what to expect from you, that they are in for the journey, that they are signed up and subscribed and ready for what comes next and they know when it's coming. And I think a lot of times a lack of consistency can really break people's trust. You know, we've all been subscribed to those email lists where we only get emails when they have something to sell, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, wait, where were you the last few months? Or, you know, what value have you given me? You're only ever selling to me. Let me hit unsubscribe. And so I think that consistency can be really huge, but it can also be something personally that shows you and proves to you that you are a creator. I think that consistency can challenge our creativity sometimes if we're just not feeling it or we're kind of questioning, well, what's next or what do I create next? But I think that when we can partner consistency with creativity and do it in a way it can really bolster our confidence in showing up and showing up when we don't have all the answers or showing up when we're not quite sure how we want to say something. So consistency is the first thing when creating content. The second thing is being super results oriented so that every piece of content is tied to a tangible result. So I touched on this before, but this is absolutely critical. And I always imagine standing on the stage at Shark Tank with that daunting music and telling, you know, Barbara Corcoran what I created and having her be like, well, what does that do? Or like, what's the point? (laughs) Or like, what are you hoping for? And I think a lot of times, yeah, right. We create so blindly, like we create with like, you know, these expectations, but we don't actually tie them to anything tangible. And I think that when we shift the way that we create so that we can say, you know, the goal of this piece is to, and it could be, you know, get people to subscribe to our email list or get people to click off of this app and land on our blog where we can serve them better or get people to subscribe to our show or get people to forward this email to a friend or whatever that might be. When we can create being results oriented, it's way easier to tie our efforts to actual results. And thus it makes creating way more fun because we know that it's actually moving the needle. I think so many entrepreneurs are so stressed out and so busy with things that don't move the needle because they've never asked themselves, what is this supposed to do? (laughs) How do I measure if this is working? And so being results oriented is number two. And then number three is just strategy for how you will keep that content working for you long after you create it. So again, not putting yourself on the vicious cycle that I put myself on, where I literally created a post every single day, posted it once on Facebook and was on to the next thing when barely anyone saw that first post to start with. And so figuring out okay, how am I going to promote this post that was published today? How am I going to promote it a month from now? Is it content that's still going to be relevant a month from now? What's that going to look like? And what platforms can I share it on to make sure that it's getting the best exposure and the most opportunities to make an impact? And honestly, for us, we found so many different things, but we try to get our content blasted everywhere. So we're creating it and we generally create it in a space that we own because we have more control over that experience. We can do things like guide people to a similar post or have a pop-up that invites them to an additional resource or gets them on our email list or whatever that looks like, which is all part of the experience. But you want to make sure that when you're creating something, it's not a one and done. You're not a one hit wonder and your content shouldn't be either. You want to figure out how to extend that life of it and how to make sure that it can work for you long after you create it. And there are so many different methods to do that. I think knowing that those three tips help you start off with a strong content creation strategy 
at the same time, even though you know what you're supposed to do, it's overwhelming to think about it all at once at the start. And sometimes that can like paralyze people at the starting line because they know what they should do, but it's just too much. They just want to start writing or they want to start blogging. And so that was actually kind of the catalyst and the reason behind creating the content lab was that we know what has to be done to create content that's strategic and drives a result to the brand for long after it's created. And so and like, instead of trying to think about those three things as a very nebulous should do, we have created that roadmap in the content lab, which was a really kind of fun process to look at our content creation strategy, and then also make sure we're still following our own tips um, but to put it out there for students as well. Well, it's so crazy because when I look at all of my different courses, they all require content, right? Yeah. So you look at building your email list, you need to create content. We look at Instagram, we look at Pinterest, we look at podcasting. All of it is centered around content. But a lot of times that missing piece of the puzzle for people is how to create strategically, how to create content that actually moves the needle, how to create content that drives results without getting yourself onto this hamster wheel that feels like you can't step off of it. And so it's incredible because the things that we teach, it's not about working harder, it's about working smarter. And it's like when you have these systems and this awareness, it actually is freeing so that you feel like I don't just have to hit publish because somebody said it. I'm hitting publish because I know what this is going to do and I understand how this is going to work in the big picture. And so it's like literally the perfect complement to every single program we have because every single program out there when it comes to strategy and marketing is really rooted in content creation. So this is a great question. This came in from Instagram. And I feel like we've talked about how we come up with ideas for podcast episodes and things like that. But Ashley Siebert wants to know, how do you keep coming up with great content? So I mean, here's the thing is we are constantly analyzing and listening. And I think those are the two things. So if you're just starting out, start with listening. What are people asking you? What are you the go-to person for? What is something that if you were thrust up on a stage, you could speak about unprepared for 15 minutes straight? What makes you different? What sets you apart? So those are the questions that if you're just starting out, it's like begin there, begin with what you know, begin with what you're good at, begin with those core competencies that really fire you up and that come naturally to you. Now, if you're an established content creator, or if you're someone listening to this show and you're like, man, I am on that hamster wheel. I don't even know what I'm creating for or if it's working or what it's doing. Let the numbers speak to you. There are so many different ways that you can see feedback in real time, whether it's through Google Analytics or Facebook or Instagram engagement or whatever that is or what's showing up in your DMs. But we often look at and pull like, what are our top 10 posts right now? What are people searching for? What are they typing in the search bar? What are posts that are relevant that we created before that we could share again? And using the content that we've already created and relying on it more as a library of resources than just something collecting dust allows us this ability to continue pointing back to it and getting it results in the long term. And so we really just continue to take inventory and look at all of the numbers, look at search results, look at what people are typing into search bars, and then asking ourselves, what is our take on it? Or what is different about the way that we approach this? Or what is something that has changed in our strategy or in our beliefs? And that's how we kind of just continue to generate ideas. And trust me, we have more ideas than we have time to create, which is pretty exciting and a good place to be. Yeah. So I have to tell you about this cool tool I found from HubSpot. I don't know if you've played around with it yet, but I'm obsessed with it. I just discovered it. Sometimes as a content creator, or if you create content as part of your business and you're a solopreneur, one of the things you miss out on is kind of like this hive mind, your ability to bounce ideas off each other and like just get inspiration. So HubSpot has a blog topic generator. And I think it applies to podcast topics or even just social media post topics. But you can put in five nouns and then hit give me ideas. 
and they will serve up a year's worth of blog ideas. It's that like magical. It's amazing. So I just did it. I put in, I did it from your perspective. So I put in motherhood, entrepreneurship, podcasting, social media, and I forget the fifth one, but I hit give me ideas. And so here are the five topics they served up. Motherhood, expectations versus reality. I can see you doing a blog post on that. Will entrepreneurship ever rule the world? Okay. (laughs) Love it. The next big thing in podcasting. Mm. We could totally talk about that. Yes. Social media explained in fewer than 140 characters. What is that for a tweet? That's pretty good. And finally, this week's top topics about motherhood. So what other people are talking about in the space. But I just love that tool to be able to get your mind going when you are at a complete standstill. Yeah. And how cool that you get to type in like the topics and you can replace motherhood or any of those words with any of the other topics you want to cover. And right there, not only is that a great topic, but it's also a great title as well. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So I'll link that in the show notes, but it's from HubSpot. It's the blog topic generator. They serve you up five and then you can get a full year's worth. So it's super cool. That is awesome. I think what I want people to know when it comes to content is one, that you can own that title with pride and understand that your content is working for you. You're not working for it. It can work for you if you approach it in the right way. And if you do so with the idea in mind that you are going to serve people and make a bigger impact. And I also just think that when it comes to content, so many people are blindly creating and just throwing things out into the universe without really understanding what it's doing for you, for your business, for your results. And so I just am a huge believer that we are all content creators out there, whether you are creating a product or an offer or a service. And that content is required these days in order to get the word out, to gain awareness, to build up that no like, and trust factor. And so I don't want you to be afraid of it. I want you to embrace it because content allows you to share your gifts with the world and to get your voice out there and to share that expertise that only you have. And so content can absolutely be a game changer for you and your business, but it can also be a way to kind of build this long runway of serving and serving and serving and serving others before you ever go to sell to them. Yeah, we are all content creators. I hope this gives you permission to kind of own that title a little bit more. If it's something that you've been saying in your mind, I'm just a content creator, your content has the power to serve, but also drive results and profit for your business. It has the power to create community. And even if you're not pumping out, what what do we do? 10 pieces <laughs> of content a week? Just one piece of content can really pack a lot of power for your business. Yeah. And if you want to learn more about our program, The Content Lab, if you head to teachmecontent.com, that's teachmecontent.com, you can check out our program and our system for how we create strategically and how we make sure that our content is working for us. Again, it's not about working harder. It's about creating smarter. And so you get our team system that we follow when it comes to every piece of content we create. And again, that is at teachmecontent.com. I'd love to reveal the behind the scenes of all of the creating that happens within this brand. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Well, Kylie, this was a fun chat. I love creating content and I will proudly claim that title, but I want to hand over the crown to anyone who's nervous to put it on because content is queen in our world and we are very happy for that. I love that queen. Yes, that's right. Well, gold diggers until next time, keep on digging your biggest goals. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 